my role is to help people to realize that it's okay to say no. And that's that that's very different. That's that's a really hard pill to swallow for a lot of women um, because nobody's ever told them that. That's actually counter indicative to what they've been taught all of their lives. I can say no, I can set a boundary. Because even in growing up, when I say, you know, attempt to set a boundary in my house with my family, with my parents, with my mother, that's shot down. You know, we don't have an opinion. I tell you how to feel. You know, don't feel like that. You keep going. You're okay. You'll be all right. It's very invalid. A lot of times people come from very invalidating ways. And so that guilt just always in effort to appease everybody else to make sure everybody is okay. And never even learning how to validate yourself. Never learning how to say, what do I need? How can I ask for that? Because now I've created this role in my family at my job where I'm just the go-to person, Mm -hmm. you know. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Legacy Speaks. Today, we're going to have the pleasure of talking to Ms. Melanie Anderson. She's a licensed clinical social worker. She's the founder of Renew Reflections. And I'm so excited to have this conversation. As always, I absolutely love having conversations with fellow clinicians. And so if you hear anything that's in this episode, please make sure that you are hitting that like button. Don't forget to share this episode and please provide us with feedback. And so I'm bringing to the stage Ms. Melanie Anderson. Melanie, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait for all the gems that you're going to drop. So can you let the people know who you are and a little bit about Renew Reflections? Well, I'm Melanie Anderson. Like you said, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I have a private practice, Renew Reflections, where I provide um, individual therapy and there'll be group therapy starting soon. Um, working with adults. My primary target audience is women in the caretaking role, um, whether it's professionally or um, personally, whether you're caring for a sick parent or a single mom or things of that nature. Just um, that's my target audience that I truly enjoy working with. Um, And I've been doing it for about 13 years. Oh, absolutely love it. I'm so excited to have this conversation because I'm a daughter of a caretaker. So I'm like, oh, let's see what we can pull out. Boom, there we go. (laughs) But (laughs) but, uh, pushing myself out the way, can you please define what caretaking is, especially for women of color? What are some like trending themes or maybe even like some overarching messages that we find within this particular population? Um, Caretaking for women of color, uh, Black women, um, it's primarily where women are in roles, whether, like I said, professional teachers, nurses, therapists, doctors, what have you, um, that you're focusing on the needs of other people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times in our community, we're trained to put other people first, whether, you know, for religious or just Culturally, we've been trained, be strong, take care of everybody else, make sure everybody's okay, anticipating everybody else's needs. And in doing that, a lot of times women neglect their own needs. And so a lot of times I see women at when they run down, where they've poured and poured and poured until they can pour no more from that from that pitcher. And it's just they're running on, like I say, like a car, like you're running on fumes. And so a lot of times when we're caretaking, we're worried about other people. And we do it so well. We do it so well. We're so good at anticipating other people's needs. We're so making sure everybody's okay, checking all the boxes, making sure, just even from little things as a mom, mothers clearly are caretakers, um, just making sure lunches are made, school, things are in place in school on top of our roles at work. Um, and so it's really about learning how, so being in those roles where people are caretaking for other people, but also learning how to put that same energy into ourselves. Absolutely, definitely. And thank you for emphasizing the importance of putting that same energy into ourselves. Uh, For the Legacy Speaks podcast, we speak specifically to individuals who derive from the Black diaspora. And so that's why I was asking specifically, what does that look like, especially for Black women? And so uh, how much does like gender norms or maybe even like rules of society play into uh, our identity in being a caretaker or the assumption of the role of 
of being a caretaker? I think it, it goes back generationally. I see it in not only Black American women, but Black West Indian women, Black African women. Um, it's this, this thing, this expectation of just doing, we've had to always push through. We've always had to be the strong one because we don't have the luxury. We've always been talking, we don't have the luxury to feel, to stop, to think we have to keep pushing through, you know, put your big girl panties on, uh, you know, get over it, build a bridge and get over it. Those are always the things that culturally, generally, generationally have been taught to us as black women to just keep going. You got kids to take care of. You got your parents to take care of. You got this person to take care of. You don't have time to take, you're, you're going to be okay. Keep going and never stopping to really check in with ourselves and say, am I okay? You know, is this, is this really okay? Is this the quality of life I really want for myself? So absolutely, it's, it's definitely a generational thing. And I personally noticed that working with women, probably millennials now, millennials and younger, um, are starting to realize this is not okay. Like this is not sustainable. <laughs> and I think you think about your grandmother, your, your mom, your grandmother, you know, the illnesses they have, the stress illness, the, the illnesses that are exacerbated by stress diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, they've run rampant in our community. And because we're not taking care of ourselves, we're not even going to the doctor, we'll take so-and-so to the doctor, but we won't take ourselves until you're forced, until you have to go to the ER, until you have to, you know, your body's forcing you to stop and do something different. Yeah, definitely. That um, need to delay of self Mm -hmm. um, and being very self-sacrificial in order to uh, make sure that everyone else around you is taken care of. There's something that I always tell my clients, like the I versus the we. Um, so mm -hmm. making sure that you learn how to take care of the I so that you can be able to be of service to the we, um, especially with us from a multicultural perspective, people of color, we have been conditioned to always be, um, very collectivist in nature. And so sometimes we have a tendency of just trying to make sure that we, like you mentioned, put ourselves to the back burner so that our family is taken care of, or maybe even our teams at work are excelling, or maybe the opportunity to like, uh, make sure that our partner is doing well. And so can you speak to uh, how much that impacts our identity? Because we have these beliefs that um, have either been learned um, from time, like generations on, but at what point does that belief become a, a way of living for us? I think that it, it's tied in our identities. So a lot of times the care, caretaker role is the, the belief that this is my role. This is who I am. I take care of everybody else. A lot of times it's based in trauma. A mm -hmm. lot of times people have learned deep rooted, have childhood trauma where they have that belief that I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. And so they shift that focus to making sure oh, nobody else feels that way. And so there's that, that deeper inner belief that I'm that unworthiness that drives us a lot of times not every I'm not going to generalize but a lot of times that <laughs> it, it can drive that behavior um and just like I guess the teacher you know if you're at work and you're you know oh my gosh I have to do this I you know I have to be this I have to be on for everybody else I'm you know the therapist the nurse the mom the wife the whoever whatever caretaking role you're in always having to be on always having to be present and show up for everybody else and just then people reinforce that with positive, you know, you get that positive behavior, positive feedback. You go, oh, you girl, you got it going on. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, look at your life. Oh, it looks so great. And not knowing that, but when you get home, you're crashing, you're, you take that mask off and you're just done, you know? And, and really, like you said, taking, learning to take care of that eye to set those boundaries and to say, yeah, no, I'm, and, and being okay, being okay with not being okay today. And a lot of times we're not trained to give ourselves that permission to say, I'm not okay today. This is, this is not a good day for me. I have to say no to something yes. because that guilt sets in. Oh, come on. Guilt versus shame. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, yes. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know the difference between guilt and shame, guilt says that I'm doing something wrong or I'm doing something bad. Absolutely. Whereas shame says that I am bad. And so yes. I find that especially with individuals who feel as though they're not meeting certain expectations, uh, they take on this belief that because I'm not performing to the way that 
other people uh, would want me to perform, then obviously, like you mentioned, I'm unworthy, I'm unvaluable, I don't bring anything to the table, right. not recognizing that you can't always be on. This reminds me of like this a post that I saw on Instagram that says, uh, I can do everything by myself, but I'll be tired as hell at the end of the day. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that is true. Yeah. That is so true. Absolutely. So Absolutely. how do you help your clients understand the detriments of caretaking and shifting the focus from caretaking of others to caretaking of self. Absolutely. Um, like I said, a lot of times when clients come in to see me, they are a low, you know, they, they really recognize that there is something wrong. This is not normal. I don't know. I, I don't have to give anymore. And that depression sets in, that anxiety sets in, then because that's their identity. People are reliant. Re people are relying on me and I feel guilty when I'm not able to give them what they want. Mm. And so my role is to help people to realize that it's okay to say no. And that's, that, that's very different. That's, that's a really hard pill to swallow for a lot of women um, because nobody's ever told them that that's actually counter indicative to what they've been taught all of their lives. I can say, no, I can set a boundary. Because even in growing up, when I say, you know, attempt to set a boundary in my house with my family, with my parents, with my mother, mm -hmm. that's shot down. You know, we don't have an opinion. I tell you how to feel. You know, don't feel like that. You, keep going. You're okay. You'll be all right. It's very invalid. A lot of times people come from very invalidating ways. And so that guilt just always in effort to appease everybody else to make sure everybody is okay. And never even learning how to validate yourself. Never learning how to say, what do I need? how can I ask for that? Because now I've created this role in my family at my job where I'm just the go-to person, mm -hmm. you know? I see so many women that are the go-to people in my, like, oh, you're okay. And nobody even stops to think to ask, you know, I see that meme on social media, check on the strong person in your life. You know what I mean? And that's true because that strong person, they, I gotta, I'm gonna make it work. I'm gonna make it do what it do. And to what, ex, to what detriment? Like you, like I said, it, it's starting to show up now that blood pressure is getting high. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden they've been diagnosed with diabetes, um, chronic pain, fibromyalgia. It's a plethora of illnesses that are stress induced. Um, and so really help, my role is to teach boundaries. I'm a big proponent of boundaries. I'm a big proponent of like you said, that difference between guilt and shame. So just because we feel something doesn't mean it's based in fact. Yeah. So if I'm telling myself that I, I feel guilty, but I have to ask myself, what did I do wrong? Did I go against my own personal moral code? No, I just have this intense feeling because this is what, this is the behavior that I've done all my life. So it feel, I, I feel guilt when I'm doing something else because really, people then start to attempt to manipulate you into going back to doing the things that works for them. And it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for the, that individual. So learning how to set that boundary and realizing the guilt will not kill you. And absolutely, it will, it's like a wave. It'll get intense for a while. I tell people it's akin to when you're, ha when you have a little baby and you're taking the pacifier away or you're switching them from a bottle to a cup. Mm -hmm. and there's a couple of days where that behavior is going to intensify and they're going to cry and scream and refuse. And then it will get better because they realize this change has to happen. Same yeah. thing when you set boundaries with people. They'll they'll attempt to manipulate you for a little while and you hold steady to your no and, and what you can and cannot do for them. They figure it out. Oh, yes. Listen, Melanie, it's so interesting that you uh, say that because I I always um, say this with clients, especially when it comes to like the concept of change, everybody likes change until it becomes inconvenient. Absolutely. And so like, even when you spoke about how people have a way of guilting you into uh, maintaining certain behaviors that'll be problematic for you in the long run, I think about how oftentimes, even as we are like putting the we first, I'm just like, you're forgetting the fact that people are resilient right? And so people 100%. have a way of making um, some of us feel like we are like the center of everything. Mm -hmm. But realistically speaking, if you decided to move away, or if some 
somebody passed or whatever the case may be, like people would move on. Life doesn't mm-hmm. end with you. It's similar to when it comes to like those jobs, right? When we find ourselves in toxic work environments, if you aren't able to perform or if for whatever reason you decide to quit or something happens to you, they're not going to hold your desk there and say, you know, here worked Melanie or here worked Sierra. No, they're going to find somebody to replace your seat. And so learning to make peace with that is similar to what you had mentioned earlier. I love those two mindfulness questions is what do I need in this moment and how do I communicate that? And I'm just like in that in between is like, uh, how do I learn to be okay with the fact that I need help? And at the core of it is like, even with caretaking, feeling like I can put all these things on my plate, but not being okay with asking for help. And so can you speak to what it's like to help a client normalize needing help? Yeah, that's a hard one for a lot of people. And I'll be honest, myself included. Yeah. Um, just just to like, wow, I just I need I need some support. Can you do this for me? Because if you if you own that role, if you've taken on that role of I got this, I, I can do all the things, like you said, and and realize realizing no, one, I don't need, I I don't have to, and it's okay to not have to. And so really pr- helping people to process and explore where that comes from and Again, giving yourself permission, identifying even that one person who you consider a safe emotional person Mm -hmm. that in your core, you know, if you ask them for something, they would, they would help. They would, you just don't. And just realizing, just start with that one person. We don't have to ask everybody. We don't have to, you know, the manipulators are going to say no or do what they need to do to attempt to get you to go back to what worked for them. But there's usually one person in people's lives they can ask. Even and just start small, you know, just, hey, you know, do you mind picking my kids up after soccer if your kids play soccer together? Um, or even just something like, hey, can I talk? I just need to vent. Because a lot of times people, we don't even do that. We're just like, hey, how you doing, girl? And we just listen to our friends' problems. And then by then you don't, you've been dumped on and you're tired. So you just hang up the phone <laughs> instead of saying, hey, can I vent to you for a minute? I just got a lot going on. I just need to get this out. You know, just asking for that emotional support. Yeah. Because a lot of times we hold it in and that leads to panic attacks. And so, because I see women come in, I had a panic attack. I don't know where this came from. And I'm like, well, tell me a little bit about what's going on. And then they just dump. And I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. It's like when they say that, I'm like, girl, you know why you had a panic attack. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right, you uh, Erica Badu wrote Bag Lady for a reason. Right, okay. <laughs> right, right. I actually have a picture of my office of a lady walking away, dropping all her bags. And I kept that in my office for a while just because look at the, all the bags you're carrying. Like, and it's funny, I've had people say, I don't know why my life is great. Lit- I've had this happen multiple times. My life is good, it's good. Mm. I said, well, tell me your top three stressors. And then it just opens up and I'm like, and then as they listen to themselves, because they're so conditioned to not even check in with themselves. They, is that a self-awareness yeah. is, is not there. And so just teaching to let's learn, learn how to check in with yourself. Mm-hmm. Do I have the emotional fortitude to take on something else? Mm-hmm. Do you know? And it's okay if I don't, then I don't even answer the phone. It's okay. Just because your phone rings doesn't mean you have to answer it. Yes. Yes, definitely conditioning ourselves to normalize stress because we've yes. seen the generations before us do it. And uh, when we don't challenge that, it makes us feel like we're challenging our strength, right? Well, right. if great grandma could do it or if grandma could do it, they were strong. They had limited resources. They had to do with racism and all these other things and all these number of restrictions. Absolutely. And I'm like, yes, they did what they had to do for that time. Like that's what coping looks like right do what we need to do for that moment but we switch from surviving to thriving when we're able to identify the things that we can do for what we need in this present day very very important absolutely I say the same thing it's funny I say you're using an old strategy an old coping skill for something that just doesn't serve you in this present time right now those are not I I use a bait I break it down a little bit some I tend to do this it's like when you're a baby you use diapers but at 22 42 do you need no but it served you at that time but you don't need you're in a different place now you've grown up and so just because that coping skill served you back then doesn't mean it's 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 helpful today it actually can hurt you today 
you know what I mean? But it, it was helpful in that moment. So, but learning to transition out of that and break that mindset. And I think slowly, the stigma is slowly breaking in the black community around therapy, around getting help. I see more and more people realizing, hey, I got a therapist. Oh, you too? My therapist said, and I love that. I'm just so happy that people are really working on taking time. That is self-care to go to therapy, to process and do what you need to do to get to thrive. Like you said, I, I love it. Yeah. That's so important. I think even as you were talking about that, I find that uh, these last few generations have had the opportunity to redefine what strength looks like. And then um, going back to uh, what we talked about earlier in terms of feeling like you are not valuable or you're not worthy or anything like that, it, it gives us an opportunity when we're challenging the caretaking mindset, it gives us the opportunity to recognize as Black women that we can be strong and we can be loved. And love Absolutely. looks like receiving help or being on the receiving end of help right. or uh, being able to be on the receiving end of resources or being fully present with body and right. self like we have an opportunity to redefine what strength lo strength looks like in today's generation absolutely yeah. I totally agree definitely you talked a little bit about self-care and so can you please explain what radical self-care is and what that actually looks like for your clients oh absolutely love that term um radical self-care is the self-care of you in totality. So a lot of times people think of self-care and it's like, oh, I got my hair done, I got my nails done. And yes, that is a form of, or I got a massage. Yes, that is a form of self-care. That's typically more of a physical self-care. Um, but there's emo emotional self-care, there's mental self-care, there's spiritual self-care. Um, and a lot of times are you, the question I ask is, are, how are you addressing those things? So socially self-care, are you connecting with your supports? Um, spiritually, whatever, your higher power or universal, whatever your beliefs are, or spiritual things, whether it's meditation or things of that nature, how are you connecting on a spiritual level emotionally? Are you connecting? Are you taking your care of yourself emotionally? When you have emotions, are you allowing yourself to feel your feelings? A lot of times we're trained to stuff them. Where we got, like I said, we don't have time for no feelings. We get, got to keep going, got to keep it moving. Mm -hmm. And that self care is also allowing you to feel your feelings. It's okay to be sad. There's no, right or wrong feeling. There's no bad, negative, or positive feeling. I don't like that. Feelings are just feelings. Mm -hmm. They all serve a purpose. So if you're sad, if you're upset, if you're anxious, whatever, check in with that. Find out what that's about, that um, self-awareness that I was speaking of earlier. So that radical self, radical self-care is, like I said, just really focusing on yourself and all of your needs, whether it's financial, you know, what are you doing financially? Are you do you have a savings plan? Do you, you know, are you investing? Are you working on your debt? Like all of that is self-care. Yes, absolutely love it. Even when you were talking about that, um, because I also subscribe to wellness counseling, which encourages the client to look at themselves from the eight dimensions of wellness. So mm -hmm. whether it be physical, intellectual, emotional, yes. social, uh, environmental, financial, mm -hmm. occupational, all of those things. And so I was just making sure that you identify what are some specific tasks that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis to cultivate wellness in all of those areas. Definitely. Oh yeah, I would, I always suggest journaling is a great way to just um, check in with yourself. A lot of times, you know, I, I was reading this book on journaling and they called the journal the 79 cent therapist, you know, because you can just kind of write. I thought that was a cute little thing where you're really writing and processing. And I know I've personally written, journaled and really came to some really profound conclusions about my life in doing so. So I'm a big proponent of journaling. It doesn't, you know, it's just a nice way to express and get out what you need to get out. Um, there's meditation that people do, prayer. Um, simple things like taking a bath, saying no is self-care. So saying no is self-care. So, and, and not just, and it doesn't have to be, always be a hard no. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not today. Sometimes it's not right now. So, because a lot of times we're so used to dropping everything for everybody else instead of saying, hey, no, I can't take you to the store today, but I'm going on Saturday. I'll be more than happy to take you with me, you know, pick you up on the way. Well, I need to go today. Well, I can offer Saturday. And that's a way of self-care because you're setting a boundary. So mm -hmm. you're not neglecting yourself. So many times, you know, people's exercise, exercise, of course, is a self-care thing. You neglect your exercise is the first thing to go off of most people's thing. Oh, I was supposed to go for a walk today, but this came up. Your walk is done. And so really learning to make things that 
help you a priority. Mm -hmm. It's like if you were having a doctor's appointment or you have a work meeting, you have to pro scheduling your self-care with that same intensity, that same urgency is those kinds of things. You wouldn't miss a meet work meeting. You wouldn't miss a doctor's appointment because you don't want to pay the no show fee. So don't miss your self-care appointments. Yes, make sure that you're scheduling that in there and even recognizing that boundaries within itself is self-care. Oftentimes people think we're setting boundaries to protect ourselves from the actions of other people, um, but boundaries are implemented for ourselves. And I do want to reiterate a gem that you literally just dropped. Even if it's not no, not yet or not right now is just as effective as well. Or uh, let me get back to that. Or Absolutely. let me see if my schedule allows it. Right. Or, you know, give me some time to meditate on it. You know, or even if you're married or you have a partner, uh, let me ask my partner. Right. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. Give yourself a little space, right? <laughs> give yourself some breathing room so Absolutely. that you can decide on whether or not you would like to move forward. Even if it's in the back of your mind, you're like, no, nah, I'm not with nah, it. Right, you know, right. Give yourself some time. Right, oh, absolutely. Melanie, so I greatly appreciate your honesty and your transparency. And so I would like to dive in a little bit more about you as a clinician. What brought you into the field? What uh, led you to wanting to work with this specific population? Oh, gosh. My journey into this field, I've always been in the helping field. I've worked with children for a long time. Um, I was a child life specialist, worked with, and that's working with kids in hospitals, helping them cope with chronic illnesses. And so long story short, I, I said, I want to go back to school. I researched um, degrees and I found that social work was the most, um, for me, um, um, it provided a, a great deal of opportunity and variety. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Clark Atlanta University, got my master's, master's degree in social work. Um, and then I started working, doing in-home therapy with kids and families and things. And fast forward, I ended up working for community mental health and I ended up working with adults. And so I really found that, oh, I've been running from adults, but I really like working with adults. Um, and so just thinking about my own past experiences, being raised by a mom, who a single mom, because my father was sick growing up. And so just got thrust into single momhood because my father um, was pretty ill and had to be hospitalized permanently by the time I was 12. Mm -hmm. So I saw what that looked like. Um, my mom being that caretaker to three kids, myself and my brother, and my sister, my sister had special needs herself. So just watching that and learning what that stress does, just, you know, realizing that's a lot and mm -hmm. learning that I have to step back and take care of myself. Um, just really shapes how I relate to women in those same roles because I too am a caretaker. I'm a mom. I um I'm recently widowed. So I've also had to be thrust in the single solo momhood um in learning how to support my son and, and show up differently now that I don't have my my husband here. Um but also remembering that I have to take care of myself because in order for me to be okay, for him to be okay, I have to be okay. So really having that lens even more so now to connect with my my clients in that way to support them in saying yes it, it, it's imperative it's not a luxury as we once been thought it was oh you know it's it, therapy is not a luxury self-care is not a luxury it's a necessity we, we we're not going to be any good without it yeah thank you so much for that and deepest condolences to you and your thank family you. for the loss of your husband mm -hmm. and thank you for utilizing your experience to be of service to your clients as well i find that and I see this all the time. I feel like uh, God has a way of uh, having things happen in our lives so we can connect deeper to the people that we're called Absolutely. to serve. And so Absolutely. I'm just like, man, that's why. Because sometimes I'm like, man, why am I going through this? And then maybe like a couple months later, it's like, yep. boom, this person comes into my office. I'm like, oh, okay. So I can yeah. have strength and experience to draw from. Okay, yeah. cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yes. Even with um the concept of caretaking, because like I mentioned earlier, I'm a daughter of a caretaker and I'm a millennial. And so even as I'm watching, I've watched uh, two generations of caretakers. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother took care of my great grandparents until they passed away. And my mom, she stepped into the role of taking care of my grandmother. And um, for me, I'm like, what's out? Oh, I got to mm -hmm. hurry up and get rich so I can hire right. some money. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Because uh, this is not sustainable. Like you mentioned, I was like, right. oh, this is not sustainable. And um, I have these conversations with my mom all the time, like, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Or blase squase or whatever the case may be. And sometimes we butt heads because I'm looking at it from a place of like, I don't want you to burn out like grandma did. Um, whereas like for her, she's looking at it from a place of like, this is my mom and who else is going to do it? Right. Um, and so I, I really love to see how, especially as black women, when we're having these types of conversations, what does it look like to to one, redefine what strength looks like, also redefine what relationships look like, or maybe even what does it look like to build like a generation of legacy when it comes to like caring for other people. Absolutely. So Absolutely. yeah, it's really yeah. cool. Definitely. Well, Melanie, once again, thank you so much for this amazing, amazing conversation. Can you please let the people know where they can find you and whether or not you're accepting new clients? Oh, I am absolutely accepting new clients right now. Um, you can find me on my, my website directly at www.renewreflections.com. Um, I'm on Facebook at Renew Reflections and Instagram at Renew Reflections LLC and TikTok, although I have not started my TikToks yet, but I'm going to be a TikTok and therapist. So. <laughs> We'll be on the lookout for that. Oh, there you go. Okay. You go. So once again, you guys can follow Ms. Melanie Anderson, licensed clinical social worker through Renew Reflections. You can find her at Renew Reflections LLC on Instagram and renewreflections.com. All right. Please make sure that you are reaching out to her. And once again, if you appreciated or enjoyed anything that was said in this episode, please do not be a stranger and let myself or her know. Please leave a review on this episode as well. And once again, my name is Sierra Hillsman, licensed professional counselor founder of Legacy Speaks. You can stay connected via Legacy SBKS on everything. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And don't forget to leave a review. And until next time, just stay tuned and listen to all the other previous episodes from other amazing clinicians as well. Once again, Melanie, thank you so much for your time. And I look thank forward for to continuing me. to have you. Uh, moving forward, if you have any other projects, feel free to come back, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. All right. Bye.